For tickets, go to Ticketstar Box Office for the Rush Center. Go online to gamblershockey.com. Well, Pat, Scott, I want to touch on safety in the game of NHL. I thought this would be a, a great uh, avenue to bring you to. And, of course, you guys have extensive resumes and coaching and playing in all different levels, anywhere from junior hockey to professional. And one thing that I've noticed over the past couple of years is with all the medical advances, there's more and more emphasis on keeping the head um, safe in sports. And I know, Pat, you can contest to this. Uh, your brother uh, had to end his hockey career due to concussions, and I think that's a big uh, a, a piece to this pie. So um, with getting all the information that doctors know about concussions, that's where this is kind of stemming from, all these safety initiatives. So first and foremost, I want to ask you to, and kind of to debate a little bit of the safety initiative in the USHL, and of course, just random safety topics in the game. But overall, uh, I want to get your thoughts on making hockey safer and, uh, do you think the right steps right now, guys, are are being taken to achieve that ultimate goal? And I'll start with Pat. Well, I think it's a it's a year by year situation. I think they're they're trying to educate themselves. I mean, all the way from the NHL level down to our level, this is a point of emphasis. And player safety goes in many different directions. Uh, the head is a crucial part of it, and the concussions and and everything that's going along. Uh, with those type of injuries, and it's not the injury that's happening to the player now, but it's their life and how that changes and some of the depression that goes along with it. And, and it's just too much uh, to not be attended to. And so uh, it wasn't just about fighting. A lot of people looked at the safety initiative and said, oh, they're taking out fighting. No, that was a part of it. Uh, but a lot of the different things, like our league has a point of emphasis on any hit which would be considered a boarding, a charging, a checking from behind, or an elbow or a shoulder to any form of the head. So everything gets looked at uh, week in and week out by our league to make sure that the hits that are uh, being made are safe. Uh, so the, the safety initiative, is it working? It's really hard to know. I mean, we are two years into our program now in our league. The USH or the NHL is doing, using data that's going three or four years now, and they don't have the answers yet. Uh, the one thing that they are really trying to track is the injury and the recovery from the injury uh, moving forward. Scott, what are your thoughts? Well, I got to say, w without sounding too controversial, it I mean, you take the game of hockey and how it's progressed through, you know, 20 years ago to now, one thing you're taught is, a player, an offensive player dumps a puck. As a defensive player, you try to get your stick on that guy to make sure he doesn't go in and run your defenseman through the boards. Um, some of the rules to take you know, that away from hockey, it's sped up the game. It's made it fun to watch, um, and it is fast. Now, the other side of that says because of the speed, because there is no, if you want to say filters in place, that those huge hits at high speed happen. So they're, the league's in a tough spot because they have to do something to protect the players. But at the same time, you know, accidents are going to happen. Hockey's a rough game. And for the casual fan that's watching, you know, speeding up the game, it's great, but we need rules in place to protect the players. Now, do you think, Pat and Scott, because you've been around hockey players all your, your entire life here, with the advancements of equipment right now, I know a lot of, like, CCM, Reebok, uh, you name it, they're going out and get the top-line stuff to protect their players. Now, is there a mentality to the players right now? Do you feel that I have the equipment to protect me, so I'm going to run a little bit reckless? Uh, well, No. I mean, okay. hockey has just always been, you get going as fast as you can. I think Scott hit it on, on the head. It, what happened is they wanted to open up the offense, and so they took away the ability for defenders to slow down the offensive player. The offensive player now is at full speed when he's forechecking on the defenseman. You've changed it by 10, 15 miles an hour on point of impact. So it changed it so much in that direction that it's made it, brought in a new problem. So now they've taken that and they're trying to make sure that all checks are lower and everything like that. I don't think players are playing reckless. They're playing as fast as they possibly can. And that's how this game has been played for years. It's never been a game of control, but the control has been 
taken away a little bit by the lack of ability to slow people down. So now those decisions on the safety initiative and everything like that are falling into players making respect decisions is what I'd like to say. Like they have to respect their opponent when they're making some of those hits. And I'll ask Scott this too, and you guys, there's a code when you play the game of hockey to police that code. It is fighting. It is doing that stuff. Do you think safety initiative takes out some of that where you get guys right now that just can kind of run amok and, and not have to answer the bell? I Scott? do and I, I do and I don't because the code has changed. And, you know, again, I, I hate to say 20 years ago, but if you did something that warranted a reaction from the other team, you were going to get it back. So if Coach Mickish was the, the high, for those fans that watch, if he was the highest scoring player for the Green Bay Gamblers and I came in and, and cheap shotted that player, there was a player, or the code says, there's a player from the other team that's going to come and find me and let me know that I shouldn't have done that. So that's a part of the game that we all understood back then. Um, players don't have to deal with that anymore like they used to, but uh, it's still out there. I think there is a code, and a, most, most hockey players do have respect for one another. Uh, it's just built into the game. Oh, we got to step out for a break here. I want to get back to the safety initiative, though. So when we return here on Hockey Talk, we'll get back to the safety initiative in the NHL and in the USHL. We'll be back. And we were talking safety in the game of hockey before this last break, and it's a, it's a hot-button topic in any sports. You talk about the NFL, the NHL, the MLB. What can they do to make the sport safer for their athletes? And I think, Pat, off the air, you made a very good point. It's not during the season it's the effects of what's going to happen post-career you know and stuff like that and i think in some regard we're finally getting more awareness of it well i think that's that's the biggest thing i mean the concussions now i mean in football is you know a prime example as well i mean the research that's being done on on their players and you know, brains being donated after players passing away so they can see how much damage was done. The same stuff is happening at the at the NHL level. And the research is showing the amount of depression in that that comes from multiple concussions. And so I only think that, you know, pro hockey has basically taken a stand that we have to govern ourselves. Otherwise, we are responsible. We have enough research now that shows that these head injuries are causing problems down the road we have to start to protect our product and our players. And so I think that's where 90% of this is coming from. Hey, Scott, what's your mentality then yeah, back when you played? I know we touched on that a little bit. You know, when, especially once you go to the next level from college. I mean, I, I remember, especially in the East Coast or over in Europe, uh, you know, if you're a third-line, second-line guy and I get my bell rung out on the ice, that's not even in my mind to go back to the bench and look for a doctor to say, hey, I got hit. I might have got a concussion. The coach comes to me and says, Scott, how are you doing? I'm fine. Put me out the next shift. I mean, the mentality was always go out, do your job, because there's 150 other people that want your job. And that makes it so tough on coaches and doctors anymore because, you know, players want to play. And this is my livelihood. Don't take it from me. Isn't that funny that you go from when you guys played, it was getting your bell rung now to a concussion, and there's this concussion protocol. And, well, the NHL, or the, sorry, the NFL, cannot have their own team doctors evaluate the player because they know that their team doctor is going to have a hard time saying, you can't return. They're so connected with that athlete. And so it's got to be an outside doctor that observes any time a referee even deems that that player was a little slow to get up, that player was a little wobbly, whatever, that they have to go into their, start the protocol. And there is a protocol that starts immediately, and then they move forward. And the NHL is no different. I mean, they talk about you have to leave the bench. You have to go to a dark area. Like, you have to leave the playing surface as soon as there's any signs. And if your trainers do not have you do that, they're responsible. That, and that's where this all gets so difficult because the coaches, the doctors, some of the smartest people in the world, can look you right in the eye and say, hey, are you okay? And most of the players are going to say, yes, I'm yes. fine. Put me back in there. And, uh, you know, it's tough on the doctors. Without a doubt. And, I mean, as coaches, 
You know, I've been through it with a, with my brother and uh, Cody Chupp, my assistant coach, had his career ended because of concussion. So we're very hypersensitive to it. And, you know, we've dealt with it within our organization here and even in the last two, three years. And with players having to make lifetime decisions. I mean, we had a young man who had six concussions in five years. And his career had to come to an end at 19 years old. And how do you tell a 19-year-old that your career is coming to an end? Because he has no idea the ramifications of what that could mean if he got another concussion. I'm glad it wasn't me. I, I'm glad it was our doctors uh, because I loved playing the game as well. And at mm-hmm. 19 years old, I would not have been able to listen to common sense either. Uh, so I'm just happy that our doctors were able to make that decision for him and walk him through why and, and uh, the need for the, the change in his life to make sure that the rest of his life was moving in the right direction. Oh, for sure. And hockey is your life, especially at 19, from six years old up until you're 19. That's what you think you're going to do for a living. And when someone takes that for you, yeah, it is devastating. I can see the depression and everything else that may come along with uh, being out of the game as well. Right. And, Scott, I want to say here, I still believe that a good fight in hockey belongs because it is one of the only ways to really police the game to slow down that big hit, to protect those players who are taking hits they don't need to take. And there's no more concussions coming from fights than there are from the elbow to the head or anything like that. It's just the our, our game doesn't need to have fights that aren't part of the game. And a big hit, a moment that can change momentum in a game, can bring on a quality fight, which has always been part of hockey. And I think you'll agree with that, that we don't want to lose the fact that you can still stick up for a teammate and you can still build momentum in a game with a quality fight. I, I agree 100%. And, and I can throw out names and, and people like Perry Ohm who can play the game. Um, he would go toe-to-toe with anyone at any time if they touched any teammate. And I still think that you know the mentality in hockey is it's if one's in, we're all in. And I love that mentality, and that's one thing that makes this the greatest game in the world. So I hope we don't lose that completely. Um, But I also understand the enforcer or the fighter uh, is no longer, you know, a a roster spot for most teams. Well, I had a conversation with a baseball coach at the minor league level this past summer, and one of his players had just gotten suckered in one of the bench clearing where they all come out over a – over a, a you know hit batter, and he was like it was it was the, the most awful thing. He goes, but they always feel like they can do that because there isn't that ramification. Our game doesn't have that sucker punch because there's always going to be some somebody's going to have to stick up for themselves. Where we're losing that a little bit is the ability for players to run around and make hit, hit, hits to the head and everything like that, and not feel that they're going to have to man up for that when that time comes. And that's where it's such a fine line between protecting our players with a fight and protecting our players by making sure that there aren't fights. Yeah. It, it's a very fine line, and but we, we just need to make sure our game is played the way it should be, and that's fast, skilled, but without the, with, without the reckless hits are, are the things that scare me more. Hockey Talk is back. 1440 and 92.1 WNFL. And welcome back to Hockey Talk here on WNFL. We're talking hockey with the boys here from the Green Bay Gamblers. You can join in as well. It's Hockey Talk at GamblersHockey.com. Email us your questions, and uh, if we can, we'll get to them uh, during our show. Also, the Green Bay Gamblers are back at home this Friday. It's Coors Light Night at the Rest Center as the Gamblers face off against the Madison Capitals. Coors Lights are just only $3. Start time is 7.05. For tickets, go to Ticketstar Box Office in the Rest Center. Or go online to gamblershockey.com. Of course, I'm here with Scott and Pat. I am Jason. We are talking safety in the game of hockey. A a big, big subject for any professional sports league or actually any sports league right now in the United States. And uh, I know we ended the last break talking about fighting and whatnot. And I just want to reiterate then um, with you guys, with the fan may not understand coming to a game is the stage fighting is over. That'll never be a part of the game. But I know in in looking at different articles and and reading the USHL, they never want to take fighting out of the game because it's a part of it. Well, it's a a way to uh, protect and to counteract things that have already happened. 
Uh, and so it's it's always been part of hockey. I don't think it's I don't think it's going to go away. But the number of fights, uh, it's not the stage fight where we're going to put a little show on for the fans now. Uh, it is a part of the game, and that's uh, you know I'm fine with that. What do you think, Scott? Again, I, I there's players on every team. Everybody has a role, and the role of the pure fighter is gone, and it's probably going to be gone because. Anymore, if a player can't play the game, you may go down by a goal or go down by two goals if that player is on the ice. And uh, you just can't have that in today's game. You need, you need to make sure that you're taking every advantage that you can. So, But I also think anybody on any team to protect your teammates shouldn't be afraid to drop the gloves and go do what you need to do to protect your teammates. So what, I I guess, then, what are some of the steps that coaches are taking now to increase safety? I know that's a big part of it, too. Educating. I know, like I said, in the NFL, I keep bringing up the NFL, but it's the play 60, heads up football. Is there anything like that in hockey right now, Pat, that uh, coaches are trying to initiate? Well, I mean, the, at the youth level, it's it's really big with, you know, the, the checking and making sure you're always eye to eye. And that's how they're avoiding the checks from behind and that, which is, it's a major issue at the youngest levels. At our level, uh, it's mostly through video. The league sends out videos weekly of, you know, what would be considered illegal hits and everything. And we have to share them with the players. And so the players have an understanding of, you know, what is being looked for. And that's the only way to really educate you know, our kids is for them to see examples of things that aren't working. Uh, you know, the respect for the game, I think that's on all of us. And we have to, you know, have them understand that you don't take advantage of an opponent when he's in a vulnerable position where he could be hurt. But at the same time, you, when you get a chance to make a big hit, you make a big hit. I mean, that's always been part of our sport, and we don't want to take that away. But, you know, I think education is the biggest thing that we can do, um, you know, for these kids that are moving forward to the highest levels. And on the flip side, too, in talking about coaching, and I want to take a different approach kind of looking at this, too. Uh, talk about with, with dangerous hits and, and fighting majors, et cetera. There's a lot more suspensions in the game. The United States Hockey League is a developmental league. Uh, talk a little bit about how that plays into it because guys aren't willing participants now, knowing that they might have to sit two games out, knowing that it's a 60-game season, and knowing that they're developing for a college commitment. Before you throw that in, Pat, I think there has to be an understanding from a player's level when you talk about elbowing, when you talk about check from behind. You see the NFL now, you know, these pass interference penalties and how they've taken it to a new level, protecting the quarterback. You know, hockey, players have to understand what is charging. They have to understand what is elbowing, what is kneeing. Um, Until we do, and if I can get away with it as a player, I'm probably going to do it. Um, I have to understand fully. And, and I think our league even understands that those are going to happen. Now, I don't always agree with what numbers they came up with where there'll be more supplemental discipline. But, you know, if a player receives four elbowing penalties, he's going to have to sit a game. So it's our job to make sure we educate our players. You have two elbowing penalties. Obviously, you're doing something that we have to be aware of and to make sure that that's not happening again. But... I, I don't agree with how low some of these numbers are because I think, you know, elbows can be interpreted very closely between a rough and an elbow and what could have been a good shoulder check. And so we're basically relying on our referees to make the right call during the game. And if, and if that doesn't happen, then you're trusting that hopefully the video is clear enough to correct it. We'll talk about, too, that, and, and I was going to bring up another point, but, but you just brought up a really good point. The gray area during the game, then, with the referees, because what's a fight, what's not a fight, what's a major, what's a minor. Um, talk a little bit about, has there been frustration on the coaching level, just having that gray area and just kind of figuring it out? Well, I think at first, a year ago, when we first started this mm-hmm. initiative, it was really tough. Because you felt like you were getting punched in the gut anytime a player took a penalty that was labeled with one of those dangerous plays. Uh, but now I think we've all realized that we're going through this process together. And at the general manager meetings last year, you know, we wanted to you know talk amongst each other to see if there was something we could do to take back some of the control. And I think the one thing the league's really done to help us is that penalty is still going to get called during the game because a referee has to make a call, just like he does at every level. A strike could be just outside of the zone, and he calls it a strike. Everybody on TV says or sees that that was outside the zone. He still called it a strike. We're living by that play. 
So we have to still live with those calls. But our league has done a nice job with the video reviews. And you're always just hoping that the quality is good enough for the video to overturn some of those. Well, I think one thing that the league has done well um, in increasing the safety initiative, too, is having that disciplinary committee to review the tape. And that's something that's changed over the course of uh, talking about safety in the game of hockey, where it was just, let's review the tape of an injured player. Now it's any type of minor penalty that is considered dangerous, um, any fighting majors, all major penalties. Um, those are all now reviewed by a three-person committee in the USHL. I think that's a fantastic thing. I mean, it, bringing in an outside source could be frustrating at time for coaches and, and looking at the video, but I think that's, you know, that's, a, that's a good thing to, to police that. Well, I mean, that's, they have the initiative in place. Uh, you know, the, our biggest thing as general managers were make sure you're getting the calls right. Make sure that there, there is a way to review what's going on because hockey's such a fast-paced game. Like, if we just relied on the calls that were made on the ice, it, it, then it could be real painful. And, and I agree. The code, the code of conduct, which is it, it's great. Players have to deal with so many things with social media, Facebook. There's so many distractions, and they're so visible all the time. So it's so important to make sure that they understand again uh, – you know, they represent the Green Bay Gamblers or the USHL. And when they get to the next level, they're going to represent that team. And, uh, you know, it's something.